Hi everyone, my name is Michael, Michael Dayan. I am from the Foundation Campus Biotech Geneva in uh, Switzerland. So I'm very happy to be uh, here uh, today for to present this introduction to machine learning with uh, scikit-learn and nylearn uh, for the application to neuroimaging. So first of all, I would like to con congratulate the OHBM Brain Ag Committee for pulling that off uh, remotely. And a special thanks also to Lisa and uh, Remy for organizing this uh, training session and for the invitation. Thanks a lot. So this, uh, the content of this session is on uh, GitHub here. So I guess you already have the Jupyter notebook on the data, but if not, you can uh, quickly get them uh, at this link. So I will present both uh, an introduction theoretical to machine learning, just an overview. And then we'll see the application with sklearn and nylearn. Uh, these packages are all uh, written in Python and they are embedded in a very strong uh, community of open, uh, open source uh, software. And what is particularly amazing with these packages is that they have an excellent uh, documentation with very rich examples, uh, which are very well made. And actually, there, was, uh, there were a few talks during the nylon days a few weeks ago, uh, with uh, Garel, uh, Gael uh, Varroco, uh, Bertrand Thirion, Elizabeth Dupre, who was um, uh, core developers of Nylon, and they explained that it was actually the way they code is documentation uh, driven development. So they really put the user uh, at the center, thinking ahead of what uh, would be needed to be able to start uh, using the packages. The examples are very well made and uh, that's why I'm going now to present an overview of machine learning and the framework, typical framework of scikit-learn, uh, but I'm not going to go into the details in the machine learning algorithm, especially considering we have 90 minutes and uh, it will be already quite uh, busy. Uh, and for those who are in EEG, because Nylon is um, more focused on MRI, for those who are in EEG, there is also the MNE package, which have uh, which has the same mindset, so example driven, uh, for easy access by the users uh, to the uh, package, uh, with very uh, well made examples as well, and it's uh, not a coincidence because. Um, the core developers actually overlap in between these uh, different uh, packages. Many are from uh, Inaria. Okay, so let's start. So before going into the um, uh, machine learning details, I often like to take a step back. And so I would like to have um, an understanding of why machine learning is useful in for scientific research, at least some aspects of it. I would say that one of the core hallmark of science is to have testable predictions. So, for example, uh, for Aristotle's theory of gravity, his theory was that objects fall at a speed proportional to their mass. So if you take two objects, the one which weighs 10 times more than the other will fall 10 times faster. Galileo's theory uh, in contrast, was that the objects fall at the same sp speed. So obviously you know which theory uh, could be uh, tested to be right. And uh, one experiment was done actually just a few years uh, before uh, Galile Galileo's in Netherlands, showing that uh, two objects of different weights actually fall at the same speed and there is no much uh, friction. And another fundamental aspect of science is generalization. So you want findings to apply in other contexts, uh, at least in other experiments than your own. And obviously Galileo's law was found in many different, to, was found to be true in many different contexts, including in the moon. 
So um, there was uh, David Scott as part of the um, Apollo 15 uh, mission who reproduced this experiment with a feather on a hammer. And he shows that they actually um, fall at the same speed. So now let's keep with this uh, falling object uh, idea. And I would like you to do a thought experiment. So imagine you are still in this uh, 17th, 18th century period. And at this time, uh, the problem of shooting uh, weights, objects, was uh, really um, a, a big issue to solve. So imagine you are a scientist at the time, working at university and to make ends meet, uh, as a side job, uh, the only thing you could find was uh, to throw cannonballs so, uh, with uh, cannons. Uh, maybe you, you look like more the picture on the right in the 18th century. And your mission was to try to predict the range of the cannonball according to the angle of the cannon. And that was actually not easy at all because at the time there was still uh, Aristot Aristotle's idea of trajectory in everyone's, every scientist's mind. And this idea was that cannonball would just shoot straight and then suddenly uh, fall on, the, on a straight line, a bit like the coyote in uh, Roadrunner. So obviously with this uh, scientist's idea, it was very hard to predict uh, if you could hit the target according to the angle of your cannon. So there was some efforts toward the end of the 18th century to have this table, to be able to, to have some ideas of uh, if you were going to hit or not according to which angle you should choose. Uh, but uh, there was not really any uh, uh, good uh, model. So to do your mission, you actually need three things. You need to take measurements, to find a way to make predictions and to assess the generalizability of your prediction. So to know how much your prediction will vary uh, in different situations for new data sets. So let's start with the measurements. So typically what you will need is a set of observations, also called data points, samples or examples. And in this case, it will be shots. And with these shots, you will need a set of features. So features is a characteristic of your observations, like the angle psi of the cannon, the initial speed of uh, the cannonball, its mass, its radius, etc., etc. And then you want to uh, predict if it hits the target at, for example, 100 meter. And that's your outcomes. They are called labels. And all this information is a data set. So you need a data set of observations. These observations are characterized by features. And you measured your desired outcome that you want to predict later, which is if it hit your target or not. So actually, the choice of outcomes and features is extremely important and is really fully part of your research design. So in a field, typically the observations could be the subjects and the features will be characteristic of the subjects and the experiment. So the age, sex, maybe some values in the region of interest in the brain. Uh, so RI1, 2, etc. And the outcome uh, could be if the subject has a disease or not, or if it's a normal control. But you really have to think of what your outcome should be. Actually, uh, 10 years ago, there was this initiative, the Research Domain Criteria Initiative by the uh, National Institute of uh, Mental Health, who tried to push for a different approach. So instead of having this binary diagnos diagnostic outcome, trying to have something else, because this uh, binary outcome can actually impair the understanding of the disease if all the research studies uh, too much uh, focus on this approach. Because 
people with the same diagnostic can actually have very different symptoms. And people with given symptoms can be likely to have an additional disorder, which will not be even considered. Uh, and the difficulty of having a clear diagnosis may actually cause researchers to ex exclude patients because they will not fit the gold standard of the diagnosis criteria. Actually, this uh, criteria can be uh, quite arbitrary sometimes. So the idea is really to choose, instead of this binary outcome, to choose biological, physi physiological, or and behavioral dimensions. And in this way, you can explain uh, different diseases with the same outcome. They are more general, and you can better understand the link between your uh, neuroimaging biomarkers and the disease or other diseases. So in a case, for example, instead of having as outcome if we hit our desired target at 100 meters, a better outcome could be the range, because this way you could generalize to more to different situations and better understand uh, your system. Okay. And now we need to find a way to make predictions. So imagine your original data set is uh, this one. So it's not a trajectory, is on the x axis you have your experiment angle, canon angle, and on the y axis you have the uh, range. So how far your canon ball went. So for example, for around 48 degrees, it went 75. Meters. So if you have uh, this data set, you have different models, for example, you could propose. You have um, uh, just a straight line, uh, you could have a parabola, so a polynomial of degree 2, you could have even a polynomial of degree 5, and all these models, they match your training data, your, your data set, I mean. The question is which one to choose. Let's, so we have to find the least bad model, let's say. So we have to define what is bad. So bad is the error you make. So this error, we can measure it simply by looking at the difference between your data sets and what your model will predict for this data set. So let's uh, zoom in to understand it more clearly. Imagine you have this uh, data point uh, x3 here. So for this, uh, for this point, the error will be the difference between what your model will have predicted for this data point and what your data set actually is. That's your error term. So then your total error, how do you, de you define it? So if you just sum the errors for each uh, data points, there will be a problem because you have both positive and negative errors. So they will kind of partially cancel, cancel out. So you could take the absolute, absolute value of all these errors. And that's actually uh, the absolute error. It's called the absolute error. Or you could take the squared error, which has uh, nicer properties. So you just sum all these squares. And for your error not to depend uh, to uh, not to depend on the number of data points you have, you take the mean, and that's your mean squared error. A very common uh, metric used in machine learning. So to have the least bad model, you need to have the least mean squared error. Okay? So the equation of uh, this line is just a simple line depending on the angle psi of the canon and the range r. So you have these measures, but what you want to compute is these two parameters here, the intercept and the slope. This, that's your two uh, betas. So how do you compute them, these uh, parameters of your model? So there is a general approach in machine learning, which consists in using um, the derivative. So here we have your uh, error function, actually it's called your loss function, and you want to find the minimum. What parameters 
what is the parameter beta psi, which give you which will give you the minimum error. So you know that the derivative gives you the direction of your uh, curve, and the gradient will indicate the uh, increasing values. And by taking the negative gradient, you can go towards the minimum. So you just do that iteratively. So you can see here that the curve, you start from any random point and you just follow the direction of uh, minimum error to, ar to arrive at the global minimum. And then that's it. You have your model is trained. You have fitted your model. It means you have found the two parameters. And this method of least square error was actually already used at the uh, end of the 18th century. That's why we uh, set uh, this problem at that time. It was uh, used by uh, Legendre on Gauss, who was just 18. And actually Legendre was um, a professor in uh, ballistics. So it's also a fit in this problem. So that's why uh, I chose this select problem. So now your final mean square error is uh, this number. So that's the uh, performance of your model on your on the data set you have on the training data set. So in case you have two parameters, for example for the uh, parabola, the error uh, function, the loss function will have this kind of shape, and it will be exactly the same principle. You start at a random point, and you just follow. Uh, the opposite of the gradient to go down. So it's a gradient descent. Okay, so uh, again, so we have these three models. So this one is only two parameters. We know the mean square error. The parabola with three parameters. One more parameter for the psi squared angle. And um, a polynomial of degree five. So the question again is which one to choose? If you look at the mean square error of each model, you can see that it's this one which is closest to the data set. But is it enough to decide uh, which one is the best model? Obviously, you feel it's a strange model to use. What you really want to know is how this model will perform on new data, on unseen data. So a way to do that is one way, is if you have access to a new data set, you just use a model you just fitted and you apply it to the new data. So you take the angle psi, you put it in your model and you predict uh, your range. And that gives you a vector y. And you just compare this vector y with the measurements, the true measurements you had. By comparing the two, your prediction with what was measured in this new data set, you can have Again, a performance score, a test score, again with a mean square error, for example. So the error, the square, the sum of square difference between these uh, uh, two measures. And that will help you understand how good is your model for new data. So in this case, you can see that for this new data set here, this model, the polynomial degree 5, the error is massive. So it didn't generalize well at all. The linear fit is, um, I mean, the error is is worse, but it's relatively reasonable. Otherwise, this parabola is almost the same error, even a bit lower, uh, maybe due to noise, but it's almost the same uh, performance. So that's so yeah, it's very important to assess the generalizability of your predictions, and here you can see. Uh, question is also how variable is your model? If, if you have a new training, uh, if you have a new data set and you fit again your model, is it going to change all the time or is it going to stay constant? And this is, this is a very important question. Uh, it's a fundamental concept actually in machine learning called the uh, bias variance trade off. So if we look at uh, data points, let's say 40 degree angle, we want to know every time we fit a different model, are the prediction going to change a lot or not? So knowing the ground truth is around 75 meters for this angle here, for each model here, I simulated 1000 data sets and look at how the prediction change. 
and you can see that uh, for the straight line actually so on average there was a systematic error compared to the ground truth but the variability was not that big in contrast so one with degree five uh, had a very high variability although on average it, it has almost uh, the ground truth and the parabola was at the was in the right right in the middle so you had uh, reduce uh, variance but on average was also very close to the ground truth and that's exactly the bias, bias uh, variance trade-off so the total error is the sum of the variance and the bias and it's a trade-off so models with a relatively uh, low variance as a high bias it means even with in an infinite number of data points it will be uh, far from the true function. In contrast, with a lot, with infinite data points, uh, this highly variable model uh, will fit perfectly the true function. Uh, but when you have a, a limited number of data points, it will vary a lot. And what you really want to do is to be in between, so to have a, a low bias, low systematic error, but also a low variance. And that's all the goal of machine learning practitioners to choose the right model with this kind of uh, optimum uh, trade-off. Uh, and you can see that the variance is directly linked to the model complexity. So the more parameters you have, the more closely is going to fit your training data, but the worse is going to be on unseen data, on test data. And when you increase complexity, you also reduce the interpretability of your model. It's harder to interpret. So it's really, I mean, it's really uh, better to have a low complexity model, which also is not uh, much variable. So this bias variance trade-off is often uh, represented as this kind of target. Since that's from uh, the elements of stati statistical learning book by Hasty. But typically, either you have a high variance with a low bias, or you have a high bias with low variance. Uh, if you have high variance and high bias, there may be a problem with your uh, model. I mean, that's for sure. You really need to do something else. And if you have low bias and low variance, uh, you may also double check your uh, results to check you indeed have a very good a targeted uh, solution. So to make a very simplistic analogy, maybe for humans, it's, uh, if you consider someone having um, uh, deciding, having opinions on a topic which change every day depending on which uh, person she or he met, we can say it has a high variance. But in contrast, if you have someone uh, who is uh, very conservative in his opinion on a given topic. Uh, she or he will have high bias and low variance if they never change uh, uh, their the, the opinions. So in between will be uh, to consider new data, to change or, or, or representation of the topic, and to be able to have a better, a more accurate uh, representation. Okay, so time, time to practice. So let's uh, go on the Jupyter Notebook uh, to be able to analyze uh, the data. So uh, the first thing you will have to do if you didn't do it already is to download the data uh, with the uh, following commands. But it's uh, much better if you open um, a new notebook for that, because the time it's downloading, you won't be able to execute uh, the next cells. So if you could open a new notebook, uh, that would be much easier. You open the new notebook, uh, you run this command, and you keep a notebook to follow along uh, the commands we are going to run now. Okay. So I'm not going to download them because obviously I have them. Uh, so we'll start with a simple regression model. 
So the range of the cannon angle we're going to investigate are between 20 and 60 degrees. And we are going to get uh, simulated data already generated. So if you use a GitHub uh, repository, uh, you can find the data sets uh, here. Uh, so we are go just going to read the CSV file with pandas. So you have other cells I'm not showing here, but which is on the notebook to import pandas as PD. And we are going to read all the data in this one and take a light version just for plotting. So this command, this function is actually from the Python file also in the GitHub repo, which is simply to extract interspread data, just a small subset for plotting. Okay. So we are going to generate a single data set of 50 observations. So the, the data generated uh, includes 100,000 uh, samples. The idea is just to take one. Uh, so we'll initialize a random seed uh, to be able to reproduce our experiment. Uh, if you want, you can change it to see how your results will uh, differ from uh, what I'm showing. That could be interesting. And so we're going to extract one data set of 50 uh, sample, 50 observations with this range of angle. Um, so let's explore our data set. So I need to run the commands, otherwise it's not going to work. Okay. Um, so yeah, we're only interested in looking at um, a range of angle and our data sets look like this. Uh, so we're going to ignore these true values and we are only interested in this experimental angle measured on experimental range. So we're going to plot the data sets to have a better idea of what we have here. So that's our 50 data points. So here on the x axis you see the angle, on the y axis uh, the range. So the idea is to find how to find the best model which according to our data. So for this purpose, we are going to split our data into a training, to training set to fit a model, and then a test set to see which one is best. So we'll compare three models, the same ones as we uh, saw in the slides. So a standard linear model with two parameters, intercept and slope. Uh, the parabola, uh, it's a polynomial of the blue wave of degree three, uh, degree two, sorry, with three parameters, intercept, slope, and this uh, beta coefficient for the psi square term, uh, and a polynomial with um, degree five. So it has six, fe uh, six features, and so uh, six, uh, sorry, five features, and so six parameters because of these intercepts. Uh, so we'll, so scikit learn, sklearn, has lots of very, uh, useful functions to uh, facilitate uh, your job. Uh, so instead of writing lots of uh, commands, you have lots of uh, utility functions. So this one, train, test, split, is once you give a data set, here you have some documentation if you want to look at the detail, uh, you will be able to split them into uh, training and testing uh, sets. So just to explain better, so our feature matrix X has only one colon because we only have one feature, but if we add uh, several features, we'll, we'll have all of them uh, here. But in this case, we have only one feature. So that's our matrix X of features. And our matrix of and our outcome is a single vector with all the values. In this case, that's a range. So from this set of features, we want to predict the range. And the train test split, uh, simply take as inputs uh, your x on your x matrix on y vector, and you just have to give the size you want uh, for your test datasets. So in this case, it's 
So your the size of your testing data set will be 40%. And it's going to take that randomly. So you need to give a seed. I mean, if you want to reproduce your results, you can give a seed. Uh, so since we have 50 samples, and if we take 40%, that will be uh, 20. We have uh, 20 uh, samples in our test side, and the rest, 30 in our training. So we can check that by looking at the length of the X train and the X test generated. Yeah, it will be 30 for training and 20 for testing. Uh, and it will also uh, generate the uh, labels for training and the labels for testing. So even if it's a continuous measure, it's called a label. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's have a look at X train. So you can see it's all my experimental angle, but there are only 30 of them instead of. So let's train our model. Uh, so in this case, uh, from all the near linear models of uh, scikit-learn, I can see many, they have many different ones, uh, will import the linear regression one. And uh, to, able, to be able to estimate the performance, we need a different scoring function. And in this case, we'll use a mean square error and the R2, so it's the traditional correlation coefficient squared. Okay, so every time in sklearn, there is the same approach. And once you know how to use this approach, so seeing it only once, for example, with a linear regression, will be really helpful because you can apply almost exactly the same uh, workflow to a different estimate, to a different model. So the way uh, you do it is that uh, you instantiate uh, a, a model, which is actually an object. So every model is an object. Uh, so I guess most of you are familiar with um, object-oriented programming. But once you instantiate, instantiate this model, so here I call it LM, you will have function and attributes. So methods and attributes. So let's see right now. Does it entail? So in Python, you can access these methods and attributes just by putting a point following your objects. And here I can see I can fit, I can get uh, the parameters of the model. The parameters actually, it's it's not the parameters, uh, the betas, but it's more like the hyperparameters on them. You can check. Uh, yes. So that's really, um, it's more like hyperparameters as we are going to see. Uh, what else? Uh, I can fit and predict. And that will be the main function we are going to use. So here, actually, uh, we'll fit. So our train uh, observations to our uh, labels. And uh, actually, we don't need to have the output serve, uh, saved into uh, new variables because internally, when you call that, it's going to change the internal objects in this uh, LM object. So the internal state, I mean. So now you can see there are new things inside uh, this uh, instance, including the coefficients. And that's actually the coefficient of your model. Uh, and here you just have one for the slope and the and the intercept actually it's in the intercept attribute and uh, what's interesting in uh, scikit learn is to differentiate what has been fitted there is an underscore at the end of uh, the attributes so just to recap i had um, i inst instantiated um, an instance from a, from an object from an estimator then I it was empty. Then I fitted uh, the the from this instance, and it changed the internal internal state. And now I have the different uh, coefficients as well as uh, the intercepts of this model. 
So I can actually print them and you can see the intercept uh, and uh, coefficients. So that's the two parameters of my model. Okay, so now we want to uh, use uh, predictions to compute the performance of our model on the train data and also on the test data. So just to show you how you use a predict function, you just give them, you can give a list of uh, several features. So here, if I had two features on my uh, feature matrix to do prediction, I will need a data with uh, two, uh, two features as well. And here it's just a list of predictions. But in this case, I have only, I need only one feature. So I ask, can you give, can you predict me the outcome for this observation, that observation, and that one? So in this case, it will just give me uh, three predictions for each of these different sets of features. And so the training score can provide an idea of uh, the performance of the model. So it's very simple. Again, we just call the predict method uh, of this uh, LM object on first on our training data, because we first want to know uh, how well the model does on the data we just trained. So it should be kind of uh, uh, best possible outcome for the test data. You can very rarely do better than what you do on the training data be like kind of an upper bound of performance if you want. So we predict uh, the outcome uh, from our training data and then we to obtain the performance we use the R2 score between uh, the two values so that's the uh, Y data in your training and what we predicted. So if you remember we need to compare the two to obtain the performance inside the training data. And we'll also compute the mean square error. So in this case, we see that the R2 okay, is average and we have the mean square error. What we really want to do is compare that with uh, the test data. Uh, yes, and the, your object actually have a score function, which will give you the R2 by default. So you can also uh, use that to get the R2. That's the, uh, so we'll save them, we'll save all those scores to have a plot at the end to be able uh, to copy the models. And in this case, since for the mean square error, uh, the lower is better, not to have plots going in all directions, I will take the negative, the negative mean square error, so that the greater the better, like R2. It will be simpler to compare all the different uh, metrics, performance metrics. Okay, so the most uh, usually the most useful and what you really want to know is how good is your model on unseen data. So there are many different scores. Here I'm just looking at the, MN, the mean square error and the R2, but you can see here all the different uh, scoring functions you have. Uh, so let's do it. So in this time, we, so we fitted a model. If you remember, we fitted a model on the training data now we are just going to use it to predict this new data and we are going to compare our prediction with the true uh, values which has a y for the test data set so normally the r2 should be lower and the mean square error uh, higher because it should it should be worse on unseen data and indeed it's quite uh, worse uh, we again save for the future plots and now let's do exactly the same thing but for the polynomial of degree 2 so um, the way it works for polynomial models is you just need to create your features so different powers of your features and then add it to a standard linear regression model so you need two steps first we need to create the polynomial polynomial features here. I will call it polytransformer. Again, it's an object with methods and attributes. And uh, I will call another linear regression model. I'm just going to call it differently to uh, differentiate it from the previous model. So don't forget to run everything. Okay. Uh, 
So again, that's the same thing I just said. First, you transform your features, and then you fit the linear regression on the transform feature. So here, we'll transform our features. Actually, we can look at what X train was before and what it is now. So you can say you can see that first you had only one feature, and now for a polynomial of degree degree three, you have uh, three for each degree. Degree zero, so constant. Degree one is the same as the original feature, and degree two, so the uh, your feature is power two. And we're going to fit. So this time we fit our transform features. And we can look at our coefficients. So now, since we have three features, we have three coefficients. And zero is for the constant term. We have an intercept. Uh, yeah. We have the intercept. So there is the degree zero term is not used. Uh, let's compute the uh, training scores as before. We just predict what our model will do on the training data and compare uh, with the ground truth. Okay, so we have a quite high R2 in this case, and a low mean square error. Uh, and we'll save the results again with a negative of the mean square error. And now always the most interesting, how well it does on the unseen data. So it's very important to remember you again have to transform uh, your uh, test data to have uh, three uh, features. So in this case, you may wonder why we called fit transform. So there are often uh, three different methods for different purposes. There is fit, which is going to uh, kind of compute the parameters needed to do the transform and then you do the transform. But you can do both at once by doing fit transform. And that's what we do here, two steps in one. So we're going to transform our features and then use the model which has been fitted on the training data to predict unseen data. And we compare that to the ground truth. So this time the ground truth is white Y test. And it should be worse. So. But in this case, very surprisingly, it's the same. So that's the best case scenario. When you fit your model on training data, on unseen data, at best, in the best case, it's just going to do uh, as good as what you do on your training. And actually, that's uh, the case here. Again, we're going to save the results. To play them out. And last thing, we're going to do the same thing, but I will introduce introduce you to something extremely useful in scikit-learn, which is a pipeline object. A pipeline will allow to connect your different steps together to avoid to have them to do it again at, uh, at training, again at testing, etc. Et uh, and it's very common to use uh, because often you have pre-processing steps. You don't have, you don't want to have to repeat uh, every time you reuse uh, your estimate. Okay, so you already knew, uh, know uh, what the pipeline uh, is because it's exactly the same as the degree two uh, estimator. And what's very convenient is once you have built your pipeline object, you can use the same method fit predict except it's going to do all the preprocessing steps. In this case, it will do the transformation into uh, features at different powers and then call the fit method of your estimator, which is a linear model. It will do all for you in uh, one uh, call. So you just uh, call pipeline with a list of steps. You give them a name, and then you put the objects of uh, the step to implement. So in this case, we call it poly transformer. And we'll do the polyna polynomial features uh, transformation with a degree five. And then we'll use our linear regression model. So it's just a list of tuple with the name you want and the actual object. And once you have created this pipeline, you just can consider it as a normal estimator, as if it was your linear regression. 
except it's going to implement all the steps you put in the post line. So we just fit our training data, the model to the training data. And now we can look at our coefficients. So this time there are three, four, five, six. Again, a zero here because there is an intercept. So this uh, um, feature to the power zero is not used. We are going to uh, have the uh, get the performance on uh, the training data set by comparing, uh, getting the prediction for the training and compare it with the one truth. Okay. So it's a very quite a better R square than the uh, one before, but it's on the training data, remember? And now we're going to apply it to the test data. So what's great with the pipeline here, you can see we don't need to do any transformation because here, this one is a pipeline. And when you call predict, it's going to call automatically the transformation on this one and then uh, uh, call the predict method of our linear uh, model. So that's what's super convenient with the pipelines. Uh, so we'll have a prediction and we we'll compare it with the ground truth for the test. So as we know, the degree five uh, polynomial is highly variable. On, on unseen data, the performance should be quite lower than the training. And in this case, well, it's quite lower, but not that much. So it did uh, relatively well. Uh, so that's it. We can plot all our results. So I'm just using, uh, turning uh, the list of uh, dictionaries into a data frame and uh, plot the results. Okay, so here we are. So here you can see the training score in blue and the testing score in orange, and it's always worse. I mean, that's to be expected. And what's quite uh, impressive is that for the parabola, for the degree two polynomial, it did, it did uh, almost as well on both. And same for the mean square error. So remember, I took the negative, so higher is better. And you can see, uh, again, it's better on the training than on the testing. And for the parabola, it's almost, it's even better on testing, which is mostly due to noise. Uh, so that's it. That's, you saw the principal elements uh, in sklearn, the main, let's say, uh, functions. So using the fit and predict mod, uh, methods and also how to score uh, your model. And you also uh, saw the pipeline object, which is extremely useful uh, for um, including proposing steps, including transformations, for example. So now we'll go back uh, to the slides uh, to understand better uh, how to estimate the generalization. So the question now is how to assess the generalizability of our predictions. So as we said earlier, a hallmark of science is generalization. We want to derive findings that also apply to other experiments. So as the philosopher of science Karl Popper said, non reproducible single occurrences are of no significance to science. Although I'm not sure what, would have, what was his thoughts on the Big Bang. But in any case, when we apply that to our field, we want to derive new imaging findings that apply to other population samples. So when we study a sample for findings, when we take all the samples from the same population, should apply as well. So it's very important to be able to assess how generalizable is our uh, method of findings. So in the case of machine learning, the workflow is typically to pre-process the data and then uh, to split our data into training and testing to evaluate how, what is the performance of our estimator, of our model on unseen data. So should we, should we select a model by testing several models on the tra training data sets and then applying on the testing data sets? Actually, we cannot do that because if you test many models, just by chance, one will perform uh, well on the test sets and uh, it, it will not mean much because it can't really be uh, due to chance. 
So the way you do it is really you do your model selection only on the training set. The test set should be completely untouched. And that's actually how uh, different uh, models uh, are evaluated. Uh, when you look at Kaggle, which is a website for competition in machine learning, they always keep a test data set on their servers. And the best model will be evaluated without having ever seen the test data set, obviously. And so participants have the, all the training uh, set, but they don't see uh, the test uh, data sets. That's uh, similar, similarly for one of the dream challenges and trying to detect um, uh, breast cancer on mammograms. There was a big $1 million prize and the test data set was obviously kept while all the different teams worked on the training data set to try to improve the model. And in the biomedical imaging field, we have the, this Mikai conference, uh, which, have been, which has been at the forefront of this kind of machine learning challenges. I think one of the first challenge of the kind uh, was by Mikai in the 90s for brain registration. And you have many challenges every year where you have to train your model and then uh, the uh, best uh, methods, models, are evaluated on the uh, test data set, which is on the server. So obviously it's not a perfect system. Uh, for example, just changing a few samples in the test data set can change the outcome. Uh, the scoring matrix uh, chosen can also uh, influence uh, the results. But, I mean, there's still a good system uh, to evaluate methods, machine learning uh, models. So you need to do the model selection really only within the training set. So how do you do it? You could split the training set into uh, uh, another training set on testing set we could also call validation. So we'll use the term validation and testing set interchangeably, but sometimes it's called validation of set when it's internal. And uh, we, we can do that, but that's not the best way. The best way is uh, to use what's called cross-validation. So the approach is to split your training set into equal parts called folds. In this case, it's five-fold cross-validation because we split it in five parts. One of these parts will be the test uh, data set and all the rest is training. And you just repeat that again and again to have five scores. So once you have these five scores, you can evaluate the generalizability of your model because you will get the mean score together with the confidence interval of this score. And uh, this will be done every time on unseen data because you only train on the trained parts and you test it on unseen data. So let's uh, practice this. So now we are back to our Jupyter Notebook and we'll use cross-validation. Um, so in this case, we'll import kfold. How does kfold, kfold work? Uh, you just give the number of splits you want, so number of folds you want, your uh, data arrays, and you say if you want your data to be shuffled or not. Sometimes you have the data in order, in some order, I don't know, by uh, age or whatever. And it's very important to shuffle the data to make sure in each fold they are uh, independent. And in case you use shuffling, then you can use uh, seed to make sure you will obtain the same folds if you want to reproduce uh, your results. Okay. So just for you to understand better, We'll just use a toy data set. I'm just taking 10 random ints between 0 and 1000. And we'll see, so that's it. And we'll see what uh, Kfold will do on this one. So I will do five splits on these uh, 10 observations. And here you, you can see uh, what it returns. So the Kfold will return indices for your training and your testing. So it's a five-fold k-fold cross-validation. On your indices, you can see the first two components of your data will be used for testing in the first fold. 
and then the rest for training. Then it will take the two uh, successive elements uh, for testing and the rest for training, etc. So in turn, it selects testing falls and every time all the rest is for training. You can see there is no overlap in the testing uh, indices and, uh, and no overlap between the training and the testing. Okay. And now if I use shuffle, you can see that it will be random for the testing indices and training indices. So there is no order as it was here in case your original data is not uh, is uh, is ordered. You will need to remove this ordering for all the faults to be independent. So in our case, uh, so here, uh, just to confirm uh, the size, if we use uh, five split, I don't think this is, yes, we we'll use a five um, fault cross validation and we'll compare different models. So we compare as before our linear regression together with the two POC line with the transformation on the uh, polynomial. Okay. So I will just, so what I'm doing here is uh, cross validation of the different uh, models. So I'm calling here the CAFOLD uh, 10 split, so it's 10 fold cross validation. And for each one, that's the index of the fold, that's the training and testing indices. For each one, I will call my uh, model, it's a dictionary here, you can see. So if I take the keys of the dictionary, that's the name of the model. And here, I will uh, call my model and call the fit function. And I'm calling the fit function on what? On the training data with the indices giving uh, given by the k-fold uh, generator. And every time I will fit the training to have a training uh, performance score, I will predict the training to have this score on training and predict uh, the testing fold to have uh, the uh, testing performance. And it will be done five times. So for each model, I will have the mean and uh, the confidence interval on the prediction. So let's do it. Okay, uh, we'll plot the results, and here we are. So that's the results for each uh, of the tenfold. And you can see that always, uh, I mean, always, often the testing is worse than the training, except, uh, except uh, it's not <laughs> always the case, but sometimes it's very bad. You can see you have a negative R2. Negative R2, it means the variance explained by your model is worse than the model, which is just the constant mean of your observation. Uh, degree 2 is doing actually uh, quite well on the testing set, whereas for degree 5, uh, yeah, it can be pretty bad on the testing. Uh, and that's, yes, that's for the mean, uh, for the median, um, for the box plot, we can see the spread of our scores across the ten folds, and you can see that for the linear model it's very bad, as they are two on the testing. Uh, it's always worse, as I was saying, for the degree two and degree five. Uh, but degree two, here we can see a zoom on the same plots. Here, uh, for the degree two, is slightly better, and there is less variance. So you can see again. The training is better for the degree 5, but for the testing, it's uh, worse. But that's really the testing uh, score, which is important. So again, we have confirmation that the parabola is uh, uh, better. Um, now, uh, we know that sklearn has lots of these ut utility functions, and many are there to automate many of the operations. So instead of having this loop, when we create the folds manually and compute the training and testing score, we have this cross val score function which do everything for us. So how does it work? Uh, you just have to get some metrics. The only additional step you have is to create a scorer. So you cannot give just the name of the metric or the function to compute the score. You need to call this make 
scorer function with a scoring function and it will create a scorer that we will pass to crossval score. So it may not be super clear, so we are going to uh, do it now. See what arguments it uh, requires. Uh, we can see uh, that you just give your estimator, the x, the y, your scorers, and that's it. And it will do everything for you. For the CV, uh, by default, I think it's uh, 5 or 10, but uh, you can also give it your cross-validation um, object, and it will do uh, everything automatically. So let's see how it works. Here I have again all my models. And here I just have to loop on my models and cross and call cross val score with a model, my training data, my uh, k fold uh, object, and the name of the scorer I want. And jobs equal minus one, it means I'm using all the CPUs to do this. And it's very useful because for cross validation, you can parallelize everything because the, false, the computation of the folds are independent. So that's super uh, useful. And then I put all the results in a data frame. Let's do it. Okay, and let's plot the results. And here, you see how much easier it is. I just call cross val score. I put the results in the data frame and I just have to do the box plot. And you have the confirmation that uh, for testing, um, here the mean square error is uh, much better, it's much better than LM for the degree two, but it's also, uh, it has less variance than the degree five. And if you want to do even more less, even uh, less code, you can use cross validate, which can use not only uh, several metrics, but it will also return the train and test score. The previous one only returns the test score. Uh, so it's the same uh, pipeline, except I call cross validate with a list of scoring function. And this time, Oops. I can have the same kind of plot as before, uh, where I have the training and testing, uh, but instead of doing a manual loop, it's just a few lines of code. Okay, uh, we'll go back uh, to the uh, presentation uh, to go to our next uh, chapter. So this is the last chapter before going into real uh, neuroimaging data. So the question is how to prevent overfitting. Uh, so one way to do it with um, a linear regression is with regularization on other models, but we're going to see it for uh, linear models. Uh, so if you remember this plot of uh, trade-off between bias and variance, you can see the variance is characterized by a high variability in the models depending on training data. and uh, what you can do, because this variance is directly related to the model complexity, which is uh, which can be caused by the number of parameters of your model, you can reduce the number of parameters. And you can do that with feature selection. It means you remove some of your features before uh, training uh, your model. Another way is to do uh, regularization. So in this case, we can force the model parameters to be zero or to be small, because if they are big, your model is going to vary uh, uh, a lot according to the data. So by having them small, uh, you can regularize them, you can uh, make it uh, being uh, more stable. So if you remember this uh, loss function, in case you have two uh, beta parameters, two parameters for your model, if you look at the projection uh, here, we can see this projection on this plane here. So the more away you are from the minimum, the higher the value of the projected loss function. So here we can see the, the different values. So what you do uh, with regularization in this case is that even though your true minimum is here, you can uh, constrain your parameters to be only in this area, to, for them to be small or zero. So the way you do it is that in your loss function, in addition to the usual term, you just add a penalty term 
So that the higher the weight, the higher will be your loss function. So if you want to reduce your loss function, you will need to reduce uh, these uh, parameters. And here is a, uh, you just have one parameter, one hyper parameter to, to set it. And the higher this penalty parameter is, the more reduced uh, or the more uh, zeroed elements you will have. So you have two kind of um, terms, either squared or absolute value. So with absolute value, it's the lasso terms. In this case, you can see that this constraint uh, will look like this. And uh, when your loss function meets the first allowed value, it will tend to be very small or zero, more likely zero with lasso. But with ridge regression, this penalty term is squared, so it will have this shape. In this case, it will just reduce the betas. Okay, so with lasso, because they meet, uh, this loss function is more likely to meet the intersection with um, uh, x or y axis, they're more likely to be zero. So it's a great way to reduce the complexity of your model and so to bring it closer to this uh, optimum position. So lambda is called a hyperparameter and is not fitted. You can consider that for a given lambda, you have a given model and different lambdas, different models. So you need another uh, procedure uh, to, to find the best value. So let's see a way to do it. So one way to do it, uh, for example, you could try to repeat cross-validation for each possible lambda and then compare your models. The problem with this approach is the same as before because you will uh, compare them if you compare many different values you will just obtain a much too optimistic uh, performance score because it will be the best one after many trials so one solution to that is to use nested cross validation nested it means you're going to do a cross validation within your cross validation so here you try your three different parameters you get the best one and you test it. And you do that again and again. And this way you will have uh, five different evaluations of your parameters. First, every time you can not only see which parameter is chosen, is it always the same one, and what will be uh, the score on unseen data. So you have an estimation of the performance of your model. And you can also check if it's stable, because if you have a different answer of the best model in each of these uh, nested cross validation folds, you will know it's uh, unstable. So we'll have a look at an application in uh, neuroimaging data. Um, so here we are. Um, okay, so in this example, we'll try both feature selection that you mentioned and penalize regression with lasso. So I already mentioned what is feature selection useful for is to help prevent overfitting and obtain a more simpler a simpler model. So so called parsimonious because you have a simple model, it's much easier to interpret. And if you have fewer features, the calculation are faster. Uh, so we'll use a notebook, which was actually um, it's an example presented by Jack Vogel at uh, Brain Hack School. Uh, so the machine learning approach is uh, quite different, but the nylon uh, part is uh, quite similar, very similar. So first we get the data. So normally you have already fetched uh, them at the beginning of the um, uh, session, as, well, as I was mentioning. And uh, from the GitHub uh, repo you got, normally this notebook is the dataset folder is in the same folder as your Jupyter notebook. So normally this path, you don't have to do anything. Um, sorry, uh, this one is for fetching the data. Um, voila, here. The offline uh, directory is inside what you downloaded uh, from uh, GitHub. So we'll just use uh, this one. and we'll also uh, use the phenotype. Right. So this, actually, 
uh, this file is to have the connectivity matrices. I'm going to explain in a bit what is it. Uh, but first, I'm just going to get this data. So the data is in two parts. We have we are going to try to predict age from brain connectivity. So this X file is actually features of connectivity we're going to see in the nylon section which characterize uh, the connectivity uh, in the brain with functional MRI and what we are going to predict is age and age is, is within this phenotype file so for each subject we have different values and we try to predict the age value uh, okay so we are going to actually look at these connectivity matrices here so here, uh, what we can see is the number of subjects we have, so around 150, and the number of features. So the number of features you can see is massive. Why? Because the connectivity matrix is a matrix which is around uh, 64 by 64, and each entry of this matrix will be used as a feature. That's why we have so many uh, features. But one question I wanted to ask you, when, when you look at this data, do you notice something? So I just looked at this data two days ago, so it was it's really new for me as well. And actually, the first thing I notice is here, this region, it looks kind of dirty. And immediately, because it's so important to look at the data, I just plot it slightly differently. So just without interpolation, you can see indeed it looks quite dirty. And when you look closely, it seems that in between row 36 and 63, you have these dirty rows. So then I decided to have a bit uh, look into it for this in the phenotype. What are these subjects in corresponding to these indices? And what I saw is that all the age group is for the very young kids and it's not a surprise because uh, as you know the very young kids it's very hard to have them still in the scanner and motion can really affect the signal so it's i mean it's just a demonstration why it's so important to always look at your data to understand what's going on so i'm not going to remove this data uh, yet uh, i will do an example with, but it will be very interesting to see what will be the results without this data. Um, so here I decided to do just a bit a quick investigation of the uh, standard deviation of uh, these uh, features as of according to the subjects. And we can see here between subject number 36 to subject number 63, all these high standard deviation of the features correspond to all the subjects having an age less than five. So in red is all the subjects with age less than five, which I overlaid on the plot of the standard deviation of the features. And you can see that indeed, there seems to be an issue with um, children less than five. So as I say, I just got this data uh, two days ago. I mean, I just looked at it two days ago and I didn't have much time to, uh, to do much than that, but it's just to show you that it is the quality analysis of your data is super important. Okay, uh, so now just looking at the uh, number of uh, subjects per age group, we can see that actually we have young uh, kids until 12 and then adults. So we have this gap of uh, age. Actually, we can plot the histogram, the distribution of age. Here is the age and here is the number. You have all these kids and the adults. So the idea is to predict age uh, doing a regression um, task. But I'm not comfortable with doing a regression task with this uh, gap because what can happen is that you can have two clusters and just try to fit a line. And it will not be really a regression, but it will be driven by these uh, two clusters, leveraging the uh, uh, regression coefficients. So instead, we are going to remove the adults and just try to do the regression within this group. So if we cut the age at 13, we can see we still have 122 uh, subjects. So we'll do that. 
Okay. So here I take all the subjects less than 15. So O Y to predict will be the age. And we select only where uh, people are less than 13. So it's a Boolean mask here. And we chose only the one less than 13. And uh, we do the same mask to select our features. So we take all the features, the like uh, 2,000 of them, but we select only the subjects who are less than 13. Okay. So number of features is 2,016, and number of subjects is 1,022. So with that number of features, you can really expect some serious overfitting. Um, so we'll just split our data set to have round numbers, let's say 100 in train and 22 in test, and we'll shuffle. And I think it's very important because this data actually is ordered uh, somehow by age, I think. And what's important also is to do stratification. So stratification is when you create the fold, you have the same proportion of the class you want to predict in each fold. So it's typically used for classification, most never, I mean, very rarely for regression, but in this case, in the data frame we looked at, there was this age group categories. So we'll use it to do this stratification to have in the traced, train and test sets the same proportion of uh, age groups. Uh, okay, so we already know the train test split, but here you, you can indicate as many arrays as you want. So instead of the X and Y here, I will use the age class and um, here it's just uh, the indices going from zero to the number of subjects to see how they are uh, split. What's very important here is a stratify uh, argument, each age class. So it will have the same proportion of different age categories in train and test. Uh, and we ask here to have uh, 100, uh, 22 subjects in the test size. So here you can either give a fraction, a class time, like 0 0.4, or you can give an absolute number. It will automatically understand, because the fraction is always less than 1. Uh, okay. And here we just check that the stratification worked, and indeed, if we plot this distribution of age in train and test, it's uh, the same. So we'll uh, just look at the classic linear uh, model. Uh, so we should have less performance in testing, obviously. So we just do things as before. Oops. Um, so manually, remember, we just iterate over the fold. So we do a stratified K fold with a 10 fold while stratified because it's stratified by age again. So we did this stratification for train and test. We put the test, we will never use it until the very end, and we do everything within the train. So the stratify k fold will be in the train. So as I showed in the presentation, in the training set, we split it into uh, 10 folds. And in each fold, we are going to predict uh, to have the performance on the train set, and also on the test, uh, the test fold. And we save the results for R2 on the square error. Uh, so we have train test for R2 and train test for on the square error. Okay. Uh, yes, that it was. You don't have to worry about that. I had to uh, create a new uh, class to the, which it, which is uh, derived from the stratified K fold. Because normally you cannot use uh, stratification in a regression uh, because it's always based on your label Y. So if your label Y do not contain the categories, you cannot do it. So I had to create a new class. So you don't have to worry about that. Uh, and here we use cross-validate because instead of iterating, it's so much easier to use uh, the utility function uh, in scale and provide. So we use cross-validate with our linear model on X train and Y train, we have a special uh, cross validation uh, object. On the scoring function, we want R2 on negative mean square. Why negative? Again, so that higher is better. It's just a convenient thing. Um, okay, that's quite fast. We 
can already plot the results. And again, you can see here how limited is the R squared in the testing set. And same for mean square error. You cannot even see it on uh, training because in training, with that many features, you have a perfect fit. You can see the R2 is 1 and mean square 0 is 0, but it's so close to 0, it's not even plotted. Here, if you look at the box plot, indeed, you have 1 in R2, 0 in mean square error. But obviously, it's a perfect illustration of overfitting. When you try in the testing, the performance is much worse. So now we are going to add a feature selection process. And the thing we are going to do is we are going to look at two different types of feature selection, either with a F score or a mutual info scores. So what does it do is it's going to look at the correlation with your feature on the target, in this case age, and it's going only to keep uh, the N best. So what is N? So what is here, the K best. So what is K? It's for you to, to, to choose. So you, um, you call this select K best uh, object with, you have to choose yourself. What is the criteria? So we're going to select the K best, going to F score. And here, we're going to mutual info score. So you need to create a pipeline. I mean, we'll do it for convenience. First, calling this uh, feature selection, so it's going only to keep the 10 best, and then it's going to do linear regression with this k best. Again, uh, this uh, pipeline is super useful in this case. Um, so here we call the special stratified k fold. You don't have to do it, you can just call a normal k fold, it's fine uh, as well. But what's very important is to shuffle because the data is ordered. So it's super, it's a critical uh, step. We create a dictionary for to um, keep our uh, scores in each fold, uh, for each uh, model. And so for each model in a loop, uh, we are just have two models, we will uh, call cross-validate with a list of scoring and save the results. Um, okay. And now we can this one, I just rename the model, otherwise in the plots is terrible, and create a data frame, and then you can plot it. Here are the plots. So in this case, you can see, um, you can see in the training is no longer perfect score because we only have uh, 10 features, uh, but in the testing, it's not that great, it's not uh, much better. So we're going to look at uh, another uh, approach, but at least you saw how uh, you can do feature selection. We're looking at the range of a hyperparameter. A hyperparameter, it means a parameter which is not part of your mod model. It's not the model parameters, it's a parameter which is uh, above that. It's not within your model, it's just to even influence the model itself. Uh, so what's very convenient again is the validation curve. The validation curve is going to try many different parameters, for example, hyperparameters, many different K in this case. K is not a parameter of your model, is to change the way the model is going to behave. Um, and we are going to plot the score for each value of this K. So it's going to do a loop for all this uh, k range and the validation curve and methods is going to do cross validation so in this case you can give which score you want we're going to do with r2 so with a mean square error and um, for each of this k value is going to do cross validation and we'll be able to compare as the different performance and so let's so it may take just a bit of time uh, and we save uh, the results. I created a de dedicated function to transform uh, the output of validation curve to a data frame, uh, which is much easier to plot. Uh, 
and so this one is a function I uh, I wrote myself. You can see in the in the node. Yes, you can see I'm doing everything twice. Once for R2, once for mean square error. Using either the pop line with the F score as feature selection or the mutual information as feature selection. And it's something important. If you have just a single model, the parameter name will just be K, for example. If I just wanted to do this validation curve, uh, directly with uh, the feature section, I will use K. But because if it's a pipeline, because it is a pipeline, you need to put the name of your model to underscore and the name of the parameter. I'm not going to show any to show any of the code for plotting because it's not really useful. So here you can see for the parameter k what is the value of the score for R2 and mean square error. And you can see that uh, as you tend to have many parameters, you will overfit so that the training in blue, but the testing performance will be very poor. And uh, you can see that actually the best performance in this case is uh, for up to 25 uh, parameters but even this best performance is not that great it's around 0.25 for r3 um, so it's not i mean this model in this situation doesn't work well but at least you can really see how to do it when you need to do a cross validation of a hyperparameter um, so in this case we are going to look at the relationship between the predicted and uh, real value with cross val prefix. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm missing something. Uh, let me see. Oh no, it's fine. Ah, yes, no, there's something missing. Sorry, I just run this cell. Okay. So here in this cell, uh, we do the same as before, but we use the convenient function crossval predict, uh, which does everything in one go. And then we're going to uh, plot it. So now I can put back. Here we are. So what we did here, we uh, use crawl val predict, which is going to take the prediction in each test fall only and keep them. So you do your k fall, you just have one test fall, so it saves the prediction. You have the prediction on the second test fall, it's going to concatenate them for each of your fall. Uh, so that's a pretty useful uh, function because now we have our prediction from each of the test falls or unseen data concatenated, and we can plot our prediction as a function of the true age. And here we can see the R squared of uh, 0.13. Okay. Um, and what we can see is there seems to be a power law. So we could take the log of the age to have a more linear fit. I will do that quickly. That's not the most interesting part, but just for you to know, you can do it. So there is a special object called transform target, target regressor. And you, just, and you just have to call it uh, with your estimator here. So we use our pipeline as estimator. And we just uh, use it in our cross val predict uh, framework. So if we use it, use it instead, you can see indeed it's more linear and you have a slightly higher R squared. Okay, so now the most interesting part is the penalized regression. So we use lasso in this case. Uh, so we just have to call the model. Again, it's an object. And um, we use 
a random uh, state which will condition the way a lasso is uh, the parameters are, are computed and in this case we, we will want to look at all kind of this lambda parameter the penalized parameter you remember from the slides in this case is called alpha in a scalar so we want to find the best penalizing parameter uh, which give us the best uh, testing fold prediction. So we'll look at all uh, this range and so many different alpha. Uh, ah yeah, so in this case it may uh, take some time to run. Uh, but what we'll be able what we'll be able to do with this validation curve again is to look at the performance as alpha is changed. And remember, the bigger alpha is, the bigger penalty, the fewer number of parameters we have in our model. Um, okay. And that's it. So here you can see the different value of alpha. You can see that uh, with a low value, which means low penalty, we have many parameters, we have overfitting with a very high performance trade in training, but low performance in testing. And we can see that the best parameters for, you are always interested in the testing performance. Here, the training performance is just to know if you're overfitting or not. And it seems to be around here. So around uh, 0 0.05. Uh, so actually we'll take as a choice 0 0.05, which will be our best model, let's say. And we'll use cross validation to know if the, how is this model uh, doing. And in this case, you can see that it's pretty good, it's 0.46. But as we mentioned earlier, uh, it's not so good to do uh, cross validation to compare different uh, hyperparameters. What is best is to do nested cross validation. And so we can implement that. We have a special, again, utility object, lasso CV, which will do cross-validation for us. So we, we can just uh, call uh, this uh, lasso cross-validation object. And when we are going to do this scaffold, this, um, uh, this uh, cross-validation uh, with a K fold, Inside the fold, we are going to uh, call the cross-validation of lasso. If you remember the slides, within each fold, we are going to do cross-validation inside. So that each, um, for each k iteration, we are going to have an estimation of the best alpha parameters. And what will be very interesting to see, if the alpha is the same for each of the k uh, split, or if it's different, and also what is the performance. Of the time. Instead of talking, I should have run it. Let's go back. And I will be able to plot the results. So here again, it's just for plotting. Here we are. So we see for each of the tenfold, we can have an estimation of the R2 on mean square error. And in this case, you can see that the lasso model is doing relatively well. But every time it's for the best alpha. So let's check if the alpha is stable. And we can see it's it's relatively stable, but not, not completely. But we are going to take, so it's important now to remember that the higher alpha, the fewer uh, parameters in a model because there is more penalty. So we'll take one of them, for example, this one, which seems close to the median, uh, to as a final uh, model. So to analyze the final model, we'll be finally be able to uh, test it on the testing set we put aside. So that's the only time when you can fit on your whole training data sets to have your final evaluation on the test set you kept aside the whole time. So final choice is this one. 
we fit our whole training data and then we test it on this test set we kept from the beginning using still R2 on mean square error as a performance estimate. And actually, we have a pretty good, I mean, a reasonably good R squared in the model. So you could see the whole pipeline on how to fit, uh, as to select the best model with cross-validation, nested cross-validation with hyperparameter tuning. Hyperparameter tuning is a choice of the best hyperparameter. That was a quite dense, uh, but at least you could see the whole workflow. Now, what's very important in your imaging is to be able to interpret a model. It's not always the case. It's not always easy in machine learning, but for lasso, we can look at the coefficients. So remember, we can access the attributes of our object just with a cof. So in this case, um, we have 2016 coefficients. I mean that's the length, but many will be zero thanks to this penalty term. And actually we can see we have, if we count the number of non-zero, we have 33 parameters remaining out of the 2000. So it really ha be extremely helpful to be able to interpret more easily your model. So since each uh, parameter is associated to a brain connection, we can do a brain uh, plot. And that's the nylon uh, part. Uh, so I'm just going to check how uh, we are doing uh, on time. Okay, so unfortunately we are doing very badly on time. It's my fault. So we have um, we I used all the time. Um, so I'm go just going to summarize uh, very quickly, finishing off uh, the section. So if you go. Uh, up to section three, what I wanted to say about nylon, actually it was just to show an example on how to use it on fMRI data, uh, but it's really specialized to fMRI, on how the vocabulary, the terminology used by nylon is the same as sklearn. So you still have this object you call every time you want to do something. So here is to measure connectivity. And you have this fit transform method to apply. So again, there are lots of great tutorials on iLearn, so you can really reuse it, reuse it uh, easily, and you can uh, go through the uh, Jupyter Notebook. There is everything in it. Um, and just to... Yes, that was the last... Uh, this section on iLearn was on how to process uh, fMRI, fMRI data, was how to turn your fMRI data into the shape sklearn is expecting. So to the shape is the one we presented at the uh, begin, beginning of the presentation, which is an X matrix with all your observations as rows and all your features as columns. And uh, the main exercise was to transform the connectivity matrix, which is 64 by 64 into a vector, because this vector will be all your features. And for each subject, you have to concatenate these features to build your feature matrix. And your Y uh, li label well, was just the age. So there was no difficulty in this case. So I'm going to conclude, uh, going back uh, to the uh, presentation. Uh, and I had a brief section on classification. Uh, but for classification, what changed is uh, your labels, which are categories. Are no longer continuous but they are categories and the scores in this case is uh, the number of uh, good categorization so true positive true negative and how bad you did when you instead of predicting uh, uh, the patient did not have a disease you had a false negative and if you predicted he had the disease but he didn't it's a false positive and all the different scores are just a function of uh, these ones for example, you have the true positive rate, which is the number of true positive you detected compared to the uh, total number of uh, positive patients, and the false positive rate, which is the number of false positive among uh, all the negative. And so either you can use any of these metrics, but you have to know that most classification algorithms output a probability 
probability of having the disease or not. So, and you can choose what probability is a threshold to say yes, he has a disease or no, he doesn't have it. You can choose p equals 0 0.5, p equals 0 0.95, depending on uh, what is important to you. So I will just conclude uh, for this classification part that what's uh, very useful is to have this uh, rock curve uh, to be able to look at uh, every time you're going to choose a different probability you're going to have a different false positive rate and true positive rate and by going from zero to one for this probability threshold you'll be able to um, uh, trace uh, these curves and the closer you have to you are to the perfect classification the better so typically you measure the area under the curve AUC to have the performance of your classifier uh, there was a section on SVM, I'm going to skip that. Um, but what you can do is look at this slide and do the Nylon Hacks B dataset tutorial with use SVM for classification. And so here, uh, so today we saw classification, on, I mean <laughs> regression, mostly regression, uh, which are uh, associated to label data. We have the dataset with both features and the label we want to predict. That's called supervised learning. But when you don't have an outcome, a label outcome, this is called unsupervised learning, which includes dimensionality reduction, which is mostly for visualization. When you have tons of features, you can actually project them only in two dimensions to try to understand your data. You can see there are different groups. Uh, and you also have clustering as unsupervised learning. In this case, uh, you really try to understand if there are uh, subgroups uh, within your data. And it can be applied to the brain by, for example, grouping together uh, vertices which look similar according to the MRI measures, MRI measures and uh, to have different regions. And uh, it's often used actually to parcelate the brain uh, clustering. But you don't have any label, so you just have your X uh, feature matrix. So that's it. Thanks a lot for following along. It was quite dense and I didn't even have time to finish, but hopefully it was quite useful for you to have an overview of machine learning and how to use it with sklearn. You have the same terminology in sklearn and nylearn, so if you understand the main idea, the main framework, you can really uh, do it yourself, especially considering all the great examples and documentation in both sklearn and nylearn. Um, it's really uh, easy, it's, it is made easy for the user to really uh, try uh, different approaches. So I would really encourage you to do so, even if you are uh, working with AEG, with uh, MNE, which have the same kind of tutorial. So that's it. Uh, I would just like shamelessly to uh, also uh, present the brain hack we are going to have in autumn in Geneva. Uh, hopefully it will not be remote. Uh, but everyone is invited and you can check the website we often have uh, cool projects you are you can also propose uh, any project you want as long as it's related to the brain it can be eg mri or even 3d printing and don't hesitate to follow us on twitter to be aware of the next one so thanks a lot ciao, ciao. And if you have uh, any questions, yeah, absolutely not hesitate. Uh, I'm here in the chat. Thanks a lot. Okay. Okay. Cool. So shall we just jump right in and maybe uh, you want to sort of elaborate on the answers you gave to those previous questions, if we can maybe pull them out from the little box where we hit them. Um, yeah, you have I, them, Selim. Yeah, I, I have them. I can remind them if you uh, want. Or you maybe copy paste them into the chat because I'm not sure everyone that will be some oh, of those. That would be great. That would yeah, be well, kind of tricky. Let's try. Wait, it. I have them. I have them. Okay. Okay. Uh, Thank you. There. One thing is about optimal thresholding. Yes. Um, can anyone Especially help? Especially on units. This? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it seems quite uh, specific as a problem, but I would say when you try to do deep learning on uh, brain uh, images, it can be very important to harmonize the signal 
to have the signal around the same per subject. And often there is some preprocessing steps which are um, not ignored, but uh, um, like people specialize in machine learning and not spe specialized in uh, MRI processing, and they ignore this normalization procedure. And often intensity normalization can help a lot with these kind of issues uh, to avoid having a threshold, subject-specific uh, thresholds, which can be due to the intensity of the image. So your uh, uh, your net, uh, your uh, neural net is going to uh, need a, a subject-specific thresholds because of this um, not harmonized intensity. Yeah. So I would uh, recommend looking at the preprocessing and especially intensity normalization. Oh, it's really a nice question because it's it would help me. I'm one of those those people who ignores all the preprocessing and. <laughs> just yes. runs the network. How to be a specialist in everything. Yeah. Apart from intensity <laughs> normalization. Uh, yes, there is always other uh, preprocessing steps you can uh, add. Uh, but in my in my uh, experience, that was the one making the biggest difference for deep learning analysis of uh, brain scans. Okay, I have this next question lined up, the one that uh, was after that. Oh, sorry, Raul, I think I sort of uh, jumped the queue there. Ah, so it was, you already did intensity normalization. So there are different um, packages to do it. Um, and some are more efficient than others compared, I mean, there's some uh, histogram uh, intensity normalization. As if you have different um, uh, MRI modalities, there are some algorithms uh, taking all of them into account uh, to improve the uh, intensity normalization. There is a great R package for that. I will try to, to find again. Uh, but it can also depend on which uh, software you are using uh, to do your intensity, intensity normalization. Okay. And yeah, re regarding the other question uh, about harmonization of okay, data. Still on the same. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, it seems, I mean, it's hard to know without looking at the um, uh, model and the data, what exactly happened to these 20% of subjects. Yeah, yeah you can, you feel free to always give the answer that they uh, they gave in a previous uh, session on Docker and containers. Like the short answer is, it depends. And that goes for so <laughs> many questions that it's like, I yeah. I think postpone this uh, answer. <laughs> <laughs> don't to... don't just 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 embrace it just go with it but, um, yeah, i will send you the link to the uh, best package i found for this uh intensity yeah. relation because it can we, vary the quality can vary a lot yeah we have a we have a matamos channel where uh you can keep asking questions after that we're a bit short on time like right now so i think okay. um, uh, yeah, we're sorry, gonna no, no, we're gonna to extend a bit uh, that's fine. That's fine. It's just that uh, I don't think that question session is going to be uh, super long. Uh, and there's a Jitsi room. You can go there to like have a one-on-one -on -one chat if you if you wanna if you wanna do that. So next question was, uh, what kind of method uh, similar to regularization are there for nonlinear models? Yeah. So actually, you can add penalty uh, per a penalty term also to any kind of loss function, even for nonlinear model. So you can uh, use a very similar approach. Yeah. Uh, but we show it for um, for linear regression because it's uh, the easiest to conceptualize. And I chose a linear model, even if it seems not very exotic, because as we mentioned at the beginning of the uh, chat, is uh, very similar to some statistical model you will use. We use linear regression, but it's a completely fine machine learning model, and it's easier to interpret and to have a feel for it. But everything else applies. So if you go to the uh, SKLearn uh, website, there is a great documentation and, you, and they, exp they give you uh, tons of list of uh, models, but as long as you understand the overall framework of fitting, predicting, evaluating with cross-validation, you will be fine. So the aim of the talk was really to present the whole framework, the way to think about it, the way to implement it, and then it's very similar per model. And uh, after you need to spend time to understand the different hyperparameters of each model, to know what they correspond to. And for example, for SVM, I didn't have to, time to show it, uh, but it's uh, quite important to understand what the C penalty parameter is. So I explain it in the, in the slide to know how it's going to affect your model. And th the aim is really to avoid overfitting uh, by uh, looking at the both training and testing. So once you understand the, this whole uh, uh, concept, then you will be fine uh, 
for the other models. You, to, you just need to spend time in specific models you're interested in. Yeah. Uh, and then the last question that was just asked right now that I'm going to post in the chat. Sorry, I'm just going like, sorry, Michael, this ah, is like fast. This is like a rapid it? fire, rapid fire question session. Uh, so that one is a bit long, so I will let you just process okay. it. And because you haven't seen it first, so before, so you couldn't prepare your answer. So this one is really on the fly. Um, I will let you. Uh... Oh, yeah, that's that's yeah, that's the same question. Yeah, so it's a big topic, which I didn't say. So um, so you want to estimate the uncertainty of your model. That's why cross-validation is great. But then in all field, compared to uh, in physics, where you studied, I don't know, uh, uh, cannonball, is going to be the same everywhere. So this uncertainty is quite valid. But in MRI, we have a big issue with that, or EEG. Uh, the signal really uh, depends a lot, uh, for example, on the scanner, on the site, and it may not what the uncertainty you found may not apply to other sites, and it's a massive issue. And there is all this domain adaptation research uh, really ongoing to be able to adapt our algorithm to other uh, sites. Um, uh, so, but I mean, it will be quite uh, difficult to adapt without having any label data from the other side. Usually you have a label data from uh, both sides and then you can generalize because you can learn the mapping from one side to the other. But if you have only data with one side, uh, yes, uh, I mean, it's going to be very challenging. Uh, you should try to have at least some label data from side two, even a few uh, examples uh, to be able to at least learn this uh, domain adaptation, uh, this uh, mapping. Good. D, I think I'm going to sort of uh, make a, a decision that we, we, we're going to have to move on and further Q&A for this session. We'll have to go uh, into either the Mattermost chat, but you do not hesitate to fire up uh, a Jitsi room or another sure. um, video chat where people can just keep the discussion going. I think I think there's a lot of people who are interested in like getting answers and talking about this. So um, yes, yeah, and I will answer a bit more the, the questions. Okay, cool, great, fantastic. Great, no, thank you, thank you very much for uh, being here and uh, for the video. Um, the link to the Madamos chat uh, for the Nylon and, and Skylon. Can I let uh, other people take care of that because yeah. I'm a bit busy right here. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Cool. Uh, so see you in the next session. We have uh, Helena and Matthew from INCF, and we're going to have a very interesting discussion how the OHBM Open Science uh, and INCF can better collaborate together. So stay tuned. Uh, you're going to be teleported there very quickly. We just need to set a few things up. Uh, see you very soon. I'm going to end that one now. Yes, please. Ciao. Cool. Hello, everyone. So we're joined by Jake Vogel and Dan Gale, who are here to answer whatever questions you guys have about the scikit-learn and iLearn session. And um, Jake had actually posted a link to, to some other resources. So he had taught a session on iLearn and sklearn uh, for the Montreal Brain Hack School that had just happened about a month ago, right, Jake? Yeah. Yeah. So we can repost those here as well. Um, sure. And then, yeah, if you guys have any questions, I encourage you to use the ask a question feature. You can also just post the questions in the chat as well. Of course, the repos now. Cool, thank you. Um, or if you guys want to, I don't know, just perhaps introduce yourselves as well. Just mention uh, what position you have, where you're based. Jake, do you want to go first? Oh, sure. OK. Hey, Alejandro. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Jake Vogel. I actually just got. Um, defended my PhD. I was at McGill with Alan Evans, and I just defended my PhD like last week. Um, so that's exciting. So now I'm a autonomous agent for the next couple of months before I start at UPenn. Uh, yeah, that's me. Uh, uh, Dan? Yeah, I'm Dan. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Queen's University. I work under the supervision of Jason Gallivan, and I'm primarily interested in fMRI and uh, 
and motor control, which is kind of a niche area. So it's uh, fun and always trying to blend, figuring out how we can get uh, people lift stuff and move objects in the scanner. So. Oh. Uh, sorry, one second. Got some oh, questions. So yeah, Elena is asking, so multiple regression is just one ML algorithm out of many, and then within each algorithm, there are multiple hyperparameters that can be tuned. Given the sheer number of choices one can test to pick the best model, it sounds like nested cross-validation will become impractical, especially with smaller data sets. Any suggestions on how to approach these choices in a reasonable way, uh, such as making some uh, sorry, a priori choices, e.g. algorithm selection? It's, it's a great question. Do you, should I start? Do you want to yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is a great question. I mean, you know, when you if you have a data set like the toy data set that um, we were using in that tutorial, uh, you're just you're, you're kind of constrained, right? You, you you know, you probably shouldn't. Be, you're not going to get that much success probably doing machine learning on a very small number of individuals. And you will if you try complex models, you're you're likely to overfit. If you try to do, you know, multiple um, nested cross validation, you'll probably end up overfitting your training set. So. Um, Probably the best practice is if you have a smaller data set to just, you know, choose a, you know, a kind of um, a less complex model to begin with. Uh, just go with something that's less complex, that's well, that's used frequently, and so forth. If you have a really large data set, um, then you probably will have a lot more success. Um, doing nested cross validation and parameter tuning and so forth, and you wouldn't have so much trouble with that. Yeah, no, my experience, uh, I can only speak to that, which is uh, I do a lot of decoding stuff and and I just stick to kind of what's widely used in the literature. And it's typically a linear SVM and you set the C parameter to one, you don't try and tune it beyond that. And if it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. And uh, that's kind of that. I, I, I try to avoid any sort of fine tuning just because I don't have enough data. And I think that's just a big limitation of fMRI in general. Uh, data is yeah. expensive so yeah one question that was actually asked um during the apac hub presentation of this video was um how many subjects should you should you should you use if you're trying to run some sort of like machine learning analysis and i mean i was teeing for that session when i told people is that it, i mean a it really just depends on your data set and one of the big problems with neuroimaging is that we just we generally don't have such tremendously large data sets as you see in, I guess, like other areas of computer science. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I would say that, like, if you have closer to a thousand subjects, then that's ideal, at least like a thousand. But I mean, you can do with less than that. It's just you end up running into some limitations. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, I think it, it depends, like you said, it depends on your data set and the question you're asking. But I think another really important kind of takeaway from this is whether or not you're using, if you're using machine learning or just more you know, classical statistics, if the goal is reproducibility and kind of making a model that you believe in, I think the whole idea of the train test split or the cross validation or what have you is a really important takeaway, whether you're doing machine learning or not. You know, Let's say you have 100 subjects and then you say, oh, I don't have enough to do machine learning, I'll just do a regression. You know, if, if you, you know, the same rules apply in a lot of ways. If you then took another, you know, 50 subjects that you had and, and, and tested and it didn't, it might not work out. And then that model that you fit might not be that believable. So um, I think that, you know, that's, it, it's sort of like what D Dan said. It's like, you know, you, as long as you, um, you know, have your, tr uh, have like a training set and you could evaluate the performance of the model there. And if it's not working, then it's probably safe to say that, machine learning isn't going to uh, help you in, in the given situation, but you can always test it against more uh, classic statistics as, as was done in the tutorial. Yeah. So Eduardo actually just posted a question, which is, um, what are your thoughts about random forest not needing as many subjects as other classifiers? Um, I haven't actually played around with random forests uh, all that much. Again, my, my specialty is more so, you know, within subject decoding. Uh, and so, but and for that, I mean, you're only dealing with at the very most a couple of hundred trials. And so mm -hmm. I don't even really dig around with random forests in that, in that world, just cause it's not really typical for the literature. Uh, so, but in terms of whole brain intersubject coding, I'm, yeah, I'm curious to see what that answer is too. Yeah. I've, so, um, 
there's a there's a really nice um, presentation by Galvaro Co that he gave during uh, the Brain Hack School. It's actually the YouTube link I posted at the beginning. There's a channel there, and one of the videos in that channel um, has a presentation by Gael, who um, is is a fan of of Random Force and talks about Random Force quite a bit in that tutorial. And they actually uh, just, they put a preprint up um, recently with the. Uh, um, uh, Franz Liam uh, using that approach, uh, random force regression in um, predicting like longitudinal decline in in cognition with uh, um, you know some some brain features, and it performed quite well. So um, I think that there's a lot of random force seems to be emerging as a as a really great tool. I think if, as long as you're using it correctly in terms of getting away with less subjects, not sure. Uh, I don't know if I could speak to that directly. Yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert on that, so we just read a paper about it. And uh, some of my students were actually curious about that because it seems to be that some some uh, authors uh, suggest that with random forest, you don't even need to do that much. Uh, you don't even need that many subjects, nor do a lot of uh, cross-validation, which I, I mean, for me, it was like a what? And then we're trying to read more about it, but uh, there's no clear answer on why is it. I mean, is this because they're nested differently? I mean, what's what's the uh, idea behind that? But I was just wanted to see if you you know something about that. I think with any algorithm, right? I mean, the the, the true test is a is a is a true held out data set, and you know any algorithm you can throw, and if if it, it if it works on that held out test set. Then I mean it's doing a good job, and uh, but that ultimately requires a bigger sample size because now you want independent uh, subjects, and so yeah, it's uh, ultimately the the value of a particular algorithm is only you know entirely depends on how well it holds up yeah. in in unseen data. Yeah, absolutely. Just just a comment on um, on mm -hmm. also I, I know that there is something about random forest where there is some out of out of sample testing in the algorithm, at least the sklearn implementations, that okay. might have something to do with it. But mm -hmm. I, I agree. I would, I wouldn't, I wouldn't assume you can't do cross validation or leaving out data. I don't think that's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. Um, any other questions? Mm -hmm. Comments, suggestions, anything? So I, I just want to quickly mention. So so I know that this was uh, um, mostly covering SKLearn. It was covered very very well. I mean, um, a lot of really great tools going on in SKLearn. But Nylearn is also really great software, and um, kind of Nylearn in combination with SKLearn is great for neuroimaging. And just to give you a sense of what Nylearn offers, besides kind of what you've seen, is it offers really easy ways of getting from a raw a raw or processed image to a feature matrix that can be passed to um, these different sklearn um, implementations that you just saw. So it's really an excellent sort of um, pre-processing step, but it also has a bunch of other uh, specific tools for plotting that I use all the time, just being able to plot um, sort of dynamic moving plots inside of your notebook where you can just scroll through your images inside of your notebook. It's really, really helpful. Um, there's a lot of great sort of um, Kind of clustering and ICA and similar um, tools for that, that's really built for uh, fMRI data, four-dimensional or three-dimensional data, um, and so just I just wanted to point out that it's it's really worth looking into in combination with sklearn if if you're kind of coming from the neuroimaging standpoint. Yeah, and actually on the note of um, the visualization capabilities of nylearn, this is something that we brought up during the um, like the coffee break welcome session that we had this morning. So we ended up actually pretty much dedicating the entire hour to various visualization resources. And so um, I started a HackMD document where I'm just asking everybody to literally just post whatever visualization, whatever visualization tools they like, along with various like caveats and examples of how they use those. So there's one more question from Alana, which is um, from what I've been reading, it sounds like SVR is better suited for, higher, for high numbers of features, even when many features are correlated. So regularization is not necessary with SVR. Why would one use multiple regression over SVR then? Mm. Anyone wants to take that? Do you want to take it that, uh, Jake? Sure, I'll, I'll take yeah. a stab at it. Um, it. Yeah, it's a good question. So I, th I think you know, multiple regression versus SVR kind of 
as far as I understand, built for different things, right? Um, you know, with SVR, it's you know the point of machine learning is really prediction and forecasting, and you're not you're not really nearly as concerned with uh, what's going on under the hood. It's it's more of just about um, you know getting getting to a a reproducible answer or or a generalizable answer. Whereas multiple regression, I think, was more about sort of modeling um, the underlying um, kind of phenomena that you're looking at, so you can try to sort of slowly kind of build this model where you're aware of the features that are going into there and you're aware of the degree to which they're contributing. Um, so, I, you know, I guess they're kind of built for different purposes. I think that, you know, one way to think about it is if you were going to be, if you're going to be predicting or forecasting, probably a machine learning model is going to be your best bet. Um, but if you really care about, you know, the f features you're putting into the model and how they're contributing, most machine learning models are really not the best tool for that because uh, they don't really care um, about the, the the features and really honestly like if you look at for example the betas of, of some of these algorithms if you remove a few features the betas will really shift around quite wildly so you can't necessarily trust them although there are some ways of getting at that a little bit so that's that's one answer and yes yeah. support vector regression svr yeah yeah, and Yarek also just commented saying that um, as with SVM, SVR could perform much better after feature selection. So, good to know. Um, maybe let's give people a few more minutes to ask some questions. We're running a bit behind schedule, so if there aren't any more questions, I guess within the next few minutes, we'll segue to the unconference slash break. Eduardo, do you have any comments? Uh, well, sure. <laughs> I mean, uh, no, yeah, we just uh, yeah, we just analyzed some data with the well, it wasn't brain data, but uh, I was curious that it was curious that we uh, the 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 script that my student made was had a really small mistake, which nested the the cross validation differently. Uh, so basically, if I'm trying. I was trying to recall actually what exactly happened, but uh, it seems that it it uh, it didn't do it didn't do the same uh, randomized nesting, so in the end we ended up with some results that were small powered, but it was it was good, but it was kind of strange. So he just, I mean, it, it wasn't like it was bad, but uh, we weren't sure if it was good. So which he he just is that is changed completely. There was. So it's, it's interesting that one small thing in machine learning can change the whole thing. And it's very important to be careful with what you're doing and, and how they how to interpret the results. I mean, in my case, I think I will be more careful. Uh, we, I mean, we are careful, but more, more, even more now. Yeah. Do you have any comments on that, on, on the, on how do you know whether what, what you're getting is actually something interesting or or not interesting, but real. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess, again, that's probably the person with the least experience um, here. I would just say that like, the main thing that I have learned is to just be extremely careful, A, with um, having enough data set aside for the testing and the validation, but also right, always keeping in mind that um, we can't really make too many inferences about causality. Um, that's probably the biggest piece of advice that I would give to people who are starting out. Be careful with how much, I guess, like interpretability you're trying to lend to the different features in your model. One thing I always look for in in any sort of machine learning or decoding analysis is is any potential uh, avenues for data leakage. So when you're doing mm -hmm. cross validation and and say you're doing a whole brain uh, intersubject cross -val or uh, machine learning and in maybe you're compiling against multiple sites you have multiple sites contributing to the same big data set and right. uh and if you don't treat each site as an independent um feature uh and if you start blending uh, multiple sites across folds uh then you're allowing this variance account just due to the site alone because every scanning site mm -hmm. can have some sort of shared variance um, mm -hmm. if you allow that to kind of be, be smeared across your cross validation samples that can uh, introduce uh, some biased results in your in your accuracies or your your error prediction. Um, so um, I've, I've seen groups do like leave one site out cross validation. 
Uh, and there's a few good papers that, uh, that I've seen tossing that idea around, mostly around uh, Barakos group. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it, that to me is like a, it's a really good classic example of how easy it is as neuroimagers to let your data leak between cross-validation samples. It's, it's so easy because I wouldn't have thought of that uh, until I read those papers. Yeah, actually, I think one comment that I could make, and I, I hope I'm not misremembering this, but um, I believe last year at OHBM, Dylan Nielsen, who's at the NIMH, he presented uh, he presented his work, I think, like trying to mitigate the effect on of like different site differences. I believe it was the Abide or ABCD data set. I don't know, maybe Dylan is hearing could comment on that. Um, but that, yeah, you're right, Dan, That's that could be a huge issue. Yeah, these things sneak up on you and uh, yeah. and it's, I feel like, yeah, you always have to be really careful about minimizing leakage. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Dylan, combat, cool. So Olina is asking, would, would feature normalization help with this? Mm. Maybe a bit. I don't think it would overcome the issue, but yeah, combat is a really, as Dylan is saying, yeah. is a really, really um, cool, really interesting tool for blending different uh, um, different sites together while still um, kind of accounting for some uh, aspects of the sites that you might. So maybe you've got two sites that are not just they're not just different sites, but they also have different composition in terms of patient groups or ages or demographics. Mm -hmm. So combat lets you kind of sort of uh, account for site differences while still maintaining those um, differences among sites in terms of demographics and so forth. Um, so mm -hmm. definitely one possible way of doing doing that. Cool. Um, I guess if there aren't any more questions, then we will move on to the yeah. conference. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Jake and Dan. Thank you.